Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter. Governor Noem announced on Twitter that she's the first candidate to sign the 1776 pledge to save America's schools. She tweets, Teaching our children and grandchildren to hate their own country and pitting them against one another on the basis of race or sex is shameful and must be stopped. The pledge, spanning four points, says that all our children are created equal and have equal moral value under God, our Constitution, and the law. Noam's announcement comes as critical race theory saturates all levels of education. From colleges and universities, it spread into K-12 curricula, often without parents' knowledge. Many people have pointed out the ideas stem from Marxism. The theory divides people into victim and oppressor groups based primarily along racial lines. The Biden administration wants to expand the teaching of critical race theory in education, workplace training, and throughout the operation of the federal government. The Biden administration's efforts triggered widespread pushback from Republican lawmakers, conservatives, and related organizations. As more parents become aware that it is being taught to their children, some have started to push back. Parents have started organizations to oppose teaching critical race theory. Others have won seats on school boards with a mission to get critical race theory out of the curriculum. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton is welcoming parents to the fight. He tells Newsmax, I'm really grateful for these parents. I hope more people will speak out. That's the only way we save our country. That's the only way we save our kids. 1776 Action asks political candidates and citizens to sign a pledge to restore patriotic education and schools. Wednesday's decision to toss out the CDC's federal eviction moratorium in a U.S. district court left many landlords wondering what this means for them. NTD's Steve Lance has the story from Washington, D.C. Yesterday, a federal judge tossed a nationwide eviction moratorium that was set in place following lockdowns from the CCP virus. Basically what that means is that states can operate their eviction courts because the way the moratorium works is it says that states are not allowed to operate under their own laws, under the laws that are on the books. And, and now they are allowed to do that, at least uh, temporarily. Caleb Kruckenberg, attorney with the New Civil Liberties Alliance, said that the moratorium is still technically in effect because the judge issued a stay in her order. And what that means is while the government is appealing, uh, her decision isn't effective. So actually, as we sit here today, the eviction moratorium uh, is still ongoing. We had a chance to speak with Paul Howard, president of the Florida Landlord Network, who says that many of his members are small landlords who only own one or two properties. He told us about one member who is a maintenance man that relies on his rental income to survive. In his case, he doesn't have the, you know, money like that throw away. And oh, by the way, the mortgage has got to be paid, and the lights have, you know, have got to stay on the in his name. The repairs have got to be made. Mr. Howard told us that he doesn't think it's right for the government to force the burden onto the landlord. You know, I think if the, if the government is going to uh, shut down restaurants and bars and other places and put people out of work, uh, they probably should cough up the money for the, uh, for the rent, not the landlord. Ultimately, Attorney Krakenberg, who I spoke with in our interview, told us that this matter will have to be solved in the courts, but that this is a step in the right direction for those landlords who have been affected by the moratorium. Steve Lance, NTD News, Washington, D.C. A group of bipartisan lawmakers are calling on President Biden to protect religious freedom across the world. They say this issue remains a top priority in American foreign policy. Florida Senator Marco Rubio on Wednesday led a group of lawmakers from both parties in sending a letter to President Biden. They're pushing the president to nominate an ambassador at large for international religious freedom. Before January 20th, former Kansas Governor Sam Brownback held that position, appointed by former President Trump. In their letter to President Biden, the lawmakers write, religious freedom, one of the most basic human rights for all people, has historically been an area of sincere bipartisan support and agreement in American foreign policy. 
In some countries, such as Burma and China, people are violently targeted for their faith. The letter goes on to say China's hostility toward religion and people of faith extends to Tibetan Buddhists, Falun Gong practitioners, and Christians. The lawmakers emphasized the U.S.'s significant role in being a world leader in defending religious freedom. Customs and Border Protection agents are putting the petal to the metal to get masses of flowers ready in time for Mother's Day. Although the flowers may look harmless at a glance, they all have to be thoroughly inspected before they can reach mom's best vase. NTD's Grace Coulter has the story. Flowers are the go-to gift for many Americans on Mother's Day, but you might have never considered the hard work that goes on behind the scenes in ensuring that the bouquet you give mom doesn't wreak environmental havoc. Mother's Day is the busiest time of the year for flower imports, and Customs and Border Protection's agriculture specialists are inspecting flowers round the clock to ensure that moms across America enjoy a pest-free Mother's Day. This year, they've inspected over 1 billion cut flower stems bound for stores and homes across the country. Of those 1 billion flowers, nearly 2,000 pests were stopped in their tracks. Here's why this job is so important. Our guys protecting American agriculture, protecting, protecting our farmers, our market, and the food supply. And here's how it's done. CBP agriculture specialists inspect all flowers and plants by hand before they enter the U.S. to ensure they're free of pests and diseases. This requires shaking and sometimes bashing the flowers, gently enough so the flowers aren't damaged, but hard enough to dislodge any insects. Magnifying glasses are used to locate the tiny and sometimes near-microscopic pests and diseases. They're then sent away for further testing using advanced technology. According to CBP data, goldenrod, Peruvian lily, and chrysanthemums are the types of flowers most frequently stopped for carrying pests. Common pests found include the owlet moth and aphids, which can cause irreparable damage to the environment. Depending on the severity, infested shipments are treated, re-exported, or destroyed. Most of the U.S.'s cut flowers come from Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, Guatemala, and the Netherlands. Over 95 percent of the imports are processed in Miami, New York and San Diego. CBP also processes a large volume of flowering plants during the Mother's Day season. Most of these come from Canada. So when you give your mom that beautiful bouquet of flowers or pot plant this Mother's Day, you can tell her that not only a lot of thought went into the gift, but also a lot of hard work from our Customs and Border Protection agents too. Grace Coulter, NTD News, New York. Some New Yorkers are still calling to defund the police, but it seems like the city's mayor and other organizations are taking a step back. NTD's Arian Pazdar has the story. During the Black Lives Matter protests after George Floyd's death last year, New York City's mayor promised to take away a billion dollars from the city's police force. The city ended up taking away only half of that, and now it looks like the police is getting more money again. The mayor recently released his proposed city budget for 2022. The budget for the police is slightly up compared to last year. Uh, you see some new uh, information technology costs and you see some reform initiatives that the city council wanted in the reform package that required additional civilian personnel for the NYPD. The mayor acknowledged that the city is getting more dangerous. He recently announced the launch of Safe Summer NYC, a program aimed to combat gun violence and rising crime rates during warmer months. The MTA is also asking for more police officers to be allocated at its stations amid a spike in crime. The mayor announced two additional initiatives. One is a program to support the city's artists. The City Artist Corps is going to employ artists. As part of the comeback in New York City, we're investing $25 million to employ over 1,500 artists and as part of its reopening plan, New York City will start offering vaccines to tourists at popular attractions. The mayor was asked if vaccinating tourists will help the city to recover. He said that we are all connected and it's a way to help each other. But now the number of people getting the shot in New York City is going down and the city's vaccines will at some point expire. Arian Pastar, NTD News, New York.